great. Whew. So, yeah, and we got a bit of metrics. Got a bit of metrics, right? These guys get something done on average uh, three days. These guys get it done in 20 days, right? So it, it's helpful to visualize. Of course, we also it's also useful. I mean, if, if you can walk into a team room and see if people seem to be having fun, right? There's all these soft factors that also count. But here we also get a little bit of more, you know, concrete data, right? Useful. Also useful for a team to do self-diagnosis, right? Let's back out a little bit. Um, anybody here? Been in Japan? Yeah. Anybody been inside this park? Yeah? It was a while ago I was there. I actually grew up in Japan. I spent the first 16 years of my life in Tokyo. And uh, I actually haven't been to this park, I don't think. <laughs> but people who have been told me something interesting. That uh, during the, the peak season, during cherry blossom, when you walk into this park, it's a very big park, there's a lot of people there having picnic. So you walk into the park and there's a guard who gives you a ticket. He gives you a ticket. It doesn't cost anything. There's nothing specific printed on it. It just gives you a card. Okay, what do, what, oh, I'll put it in my pocket, I guess, and I walk in. I have my picnic. And then on the way out of the park, the guard is collecting the tickets. Can I have it back, please? Why? Huh? The time I spent in the park? I, that's not visible on the card. There's no time stamp. I don't think there's a time stamp. Uh, number of people in the park. Th that's my guess. Because uh, it, it's it's a beautiful solution, right? They're only we only have 1,000 cards on the table, so when all the cards are handed out, the table is empty. The guard doesn't let anybody in. He doesn't have to count, right? And as people come out, we get cards back. If somebody lost their card, we'll print a new one. Okay, big deal. So this is a simple flow control mechanism. Um, kanban just means sign in Japanese. Just a, so if you tell Japanese people we do kanban, they'll be like, what? <laughs> we do sign. Um, but the way it's come to be used when you talk about a common system, a signaling system, is visual and limited in supply, right? Because if there's no li limit to the number of cards on the table, we lose the whole point for this park, right? So that's a Kanban system, if you like, right? It is a signaling system, right, for supply and demand. And, and the movement of supplies and services. And uh, it's visual and it's limited in supply, or at least it should be. And if it isn't, your system kind of breaks down, right? This is a $10 million uh, bill or, 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 um, from, uh, from Zim Bank of Zimbabwe when there's hyperinflation. Um, if you don't limit the amount of currency in, in, in this your system, you get problems, just like in Kanban. I know it's a bit stretched, just calling this a Kanban system, but I just want to you know, help you l get this in perspective, right? Okay, so uh, Toyota, uses Kanban. Um, in fact, this is Taichi Ono, who is considered to be, by many, uh, the kind of the father of the Toyota production system, which is a Japanese word for what we call lean. <laughs> right? um, and uh, one of his famous quotes is that the tool used to operate the system is Kanban. Right? It's kind of the, the lifeblood of, of what makes this work. And, w and I visited Toyota and saw this in action. It was quite interesting. Is um, there's, there's a buyer Right or consumers such as a factory, which is you know uh, p putting cars together, and then there's a supplier supplying maybe door handles or something, right? And as the, this this supplier has expensive people and expensive machines, but they will be idle until a Kanban card shows up, saying there is demand, right? And when there is demand, they produce another an, a new batch of of, of widgets or hand door handles, and they put that in a box and they put the card inside the box and they ship it off. So this truck is going to the to the consumer or to the factory, and then there there's a person putting together a car or a machine. And as they when this box of door handles or whatever is empty, they take that kanban card and they put it in another box to signal that up oh, we have consumed it. We now need more, right? So these cards boxes of just cards go back the other direction. And there's a limited number of these cards. They're physical things moving around, right? Th they talked about like, yeah, we would actually like to have an ele electronic system, but we haven't found any better way than the physical so far, right? It's a, um, they have some parts using electronic Kanban, but anyway, so the philosophy there is it's better to have machines ex doing nothing than to produce lots of stuff that nobody needs right now, because that just generates uh, uh, inventory, right? So yeah, that's kind of the, the, what Kanban means uh, in, in, in manufacturing at Toyota, but in software, it's different. Um, there's really not a lot of correlation other than the, the ideas behind, right? Because we're not moving physical parts around so much. So software, the basic principles of Kanban, if you look, if you read different books, you talk to different people, nobody really owns the definition of Kanban. Um, David Anderson was one of the early pioneers, but nobody really owns the definition, so there is some divergence. 
But just about anybody you talk to would agree to at least these core things. Visualize the workflow, right? You know, what are the steps in our workflow? And visualize the contents of the workflow. What are the things that are in our workflow right now? And limit work in progress. So a board like this can be useful without WIP limits, but don't call it a Kanban system because that'll just be confusing, right? Uh, it's really quite core. If, it's not, if there's no WIP limits, it's, it's really not, not Kanban. Um, might still be great. So WIP limit, how many things are allowed to be here? Right? There's many ways of doing WIP limits. It doesn't have to look like this, a number per column. But somehow I'm making a limit to how much stuff can be on the board. And that's to make us fast, right? And measure and optimize flow. So uh, yeah, it takes 12 days for a, a ticket to cross this board, whether it's user stories or support issues or whatever you're doing in your process. Just you know, measure that. And then use that as, as a handle to drive process improvement. You know, what can we do to cut this in half? Maybe we need to reduce the size of this queue, right, or whatever. Um, explicit policies. Kanban doesn't really give you anything more than this. So start from what you already have and just visualize it. Start doing WIP limits and make policies explicit. Things like definition of done, or what are the WIP limits? Make, it, make even those visible. Because by making them visible, they're easier to challenge and question and thereby easier to improve, right? So make them visible not because they're standard and aren't allowed to change, but because you want them to change and therefore make them visible so we can attack them, right? So a lot of this is about continuous improvement. So this is kind of the core of Kanban. Um, here's just an example of a typical Kanban board. In fact, there's no such thing as a typical Kanban board. They tend to look quite different. But this is just, yeah, here's 16 people uh, doing f organic feature teams. That means that they're not stable feature teams. They organize and reorganize as needed to implement whatever the highest priority stuff is on the board, right? That's what they do. Um, here's a bigger, I talked about this yesterday. This was a 60 person project divided into three feature teams. Here we actually had two layers. So, so we had the big project shared board and then each feature team had their own sub board. So here were epics and uh, features and down here we have uh, features broken down into tasks. So teams are working at this level, um, two layer system. And of course you can do this electronically too. It just gets a lot harder, <laughs> right? But if you're distributed, physical is not always the best way. Although there are tricks for that too. So electronic, the principles are the same whether you do it physically or electronically. But remember, if you do do it electronically, make sure that darn board is visible all the time, right? If you have to log in somewhere to see the board, it's dead probably, right? So have a projector, make, make sure it's our TV screen on the wall so people walk by it every day um, as they go get their coffee or whatever. Um. So um, as we compare these things, we've got to be careful. We're not comparing things to judge them, we're comparing to understand. Um, I like using the metaphor of a tool. Um, and what I mean by a tool is anything used as a means of accomplishing a task or purpose, right? So there's physical tools, of course, like a hammer or a fork. Um, by the way, what's your, what's your favorite, by the way, a fork or knife? Any favorite tool? Yeah? Yeah, you like fork? Yeah? Hand up, who prefers fork? Yeah. Uh, 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 ah, what's the purpose? You must be a consultant, yeah. Yeah, it's a. S <laughs> yeah. It's a silly question. You can't evaluate the value of a tool unless you can talk about what's the context and compared to what, by the way, right? Maybe a fork is not very good for eating soup compared to a spoon, but a fork is very good for eating soup compared to a chainsaw, right? So it's all depending on what you compare to. Right, so the process tools, things like pair programming, I, I'm, I'm simplifying, I'm calling that a process tool. Uh, the product owner role, process tool. And there's thinking tools like lean, agile, systems thinking, that fluffy stuff, that's some principles. And putting a bunch of these together into containers, what I call a toolkit. So Scrum is like a toolkit. Um, number of principles, a few pr practices. and So using this kind of uh, terminology, then uh, um, we can classify tools along this axis. More prescriptive, more adaptive. What do I mean by that? Well, Scrum actually has 10 things in it. If you read the Scrum guide, it says you have to have a product owner, a Scrum master team, There's the, um, and you have a few artifacts and a few activities, and it adds up to 10, right? Depending on how you count. Right, so that's how, how much Scrum tells you to do. The rest is adaptive. So where does, where does Kanban go on? Which side of Scrum? It's more adaptive. Kanban only tells you four things, depending on who you ask, but I gave you the four most common denominators, right? And if you don't do those four, you probably shouldn't call it Kanban. Right? So you don't have to do sprints in Kanban. You don't have to have a product owner. You can if you want to, but Kanban doesn't you know, prescribe that. Right, so um, is adaptive better? 
A lot of consultants in here, yeah. If adaptive was better, like, oh, it's better to be more flexible, right? Yeah, then why not just do that? Do whatever. It's the most adaptable method in the whole world because there are exactly zero things prescribed, right? Which is a little bit silly. So yeah, there is some value. In fact, the value in a tool is in how it limits you. If it is unlimited, then it's really kind of, what, what does a tool do if it can do anything, right? So yeah, if we go this way, it's XP it tells you, you know, it constrains you even more, right? Although it's a bit debatable because XP doesn't actually force you to do pair programming, etc. But strictly speaking, there are 13 things that are in XP, right? So it's a little bit bigger than Scrum. Right, what about RUP? Does anybody use RUP, Rational Uniform? I'm gonna get some coffee, I'll be right back. Yeah. I stopped counting after 120. These are all the things that RUP, but of course I'm cheating a little bit because RUP doesn't tell you to do all that. It gives you this smorgasbord, this pile of stuff, and you choose what you want, right? So nobody in the right mind would use all this, right? Uh, Ivar Jacobson, who was born and one of the guys behind this, would laugh if somebody's like, idiot, of course you're not going to use all this. You pick the stuff you need. But the difficult thing here is that Rup gives you too much, and you take away the stuff you don't want. That seems to be hard. Scrum Kanban gives you too little. You need more. But you iteratively, adaptively discover what that is, and you add it as you need it, right? So you start with too much and take away what you don't need, and it's not really part of the process to reconfigure Rup as you go. So you're kind of stuck with what you have. Here, it's more like you get a little bit and you adaptively improve. That may be one of the reasons why these seem to be gaining more success and popularity, and this is quite quickly, you know, there's fewer and fewer people doing this. Um, but nevertheless, there are good ideas in here. Some stuff like use cases could be perfectly fine. You might put use cases in your backlog, right? Who knows? So don't develop an attachment to any one weapon or any one school of fighting, said Miyamoto Musashi, a famous 17th century samurai, right? Don't, get, don't fall in love with this one or that, that one tool. Mix, mix and match, right? When you're just learning something, I, I stole this from Jeff Patton, a great metaphor. If you're just going to learn to ski, I don't, that might be a stupid metaphor in India. I don't know. How many of you ski? Okay, a few, right? So when you learn to ski, <laughs> You, you, you learn using this kind of funny technique uh, called the plow, right? Uh, you're, you're, you go like this with your skis, right? And it, it looks kind of silly and gets you down very slowly, but it gets you down fairly safely, right? Experts don't do that normally. But if you're going to learn to ski, you better learn to plow first or else you might get hurt, all right? So you learn to plow, not because you want to get good at plowing, but because you want to be able to stop plowing, right? So it's like training wheels. A lot of this stuff is training wheels, right? If a team is really good at focusing, they might not need whip limits because they don't gather a lot of whip. You might not need the scrum master role if the team is good at self-improving, right? So think of these as starting points, not, not end points, right? And, and, and have the courage to break the rules. Don't, don't get stuck on what the books say, right? All right, so toolkits. Um, there's some overlap, Scrum, XP, Kanban. There's a lot of, like, in the middle here, I would say visualization, communication is very central to all three. But XP is more engineering practices stuff. Scrum is a little bit more about the interface between the, between the team and the outside world. and Yeah, there's little different flavors of Agile and Lean. And there's some tools that are useful in all three cases, but don't belong to any specific one, such as value stream mapping as a tool. Right? So any tool can be misused. <laughs> what do you think this guy is thinking? He just bought his shiny new chainsaw and he's trying to chop down a tree. What, what's in his mind? That yeah, what a crappy tool. And it was expensive too. The old tool was better. Right? So he didn't understand that the new tool means a new behavior. And as long as he blames a tool, he's making it impossible to learn, right? So we've got to be careful about saying that Scrum didn't work, right? for example. In fact, I'm doing a whole talk on Saturday, I think, called What to Do When Scrum Doesn't Work. Right? Um, a bit of a blasphemy to say that in the Scrum community. Um, yeah. So um, I'm going to do a little demo. and. If we had more time, I might have done this interactively, but now since we don't quite have tables and not quite enough time, I'm going to kind of just tell you what happens, right? And if you like this demo, I really strongly encourage you do it yourself, especially with your managers, your customers, or whoever it is that is causing problems, right? <laughs> right, so here's the thing. How long time does it take to write a name? If this is David, he wants me, the developer, to write. He doesn't know how to write, so he needs to go to developer, right? Uh, if it's just a metaphor here, right? So writing text is a metaphor for writing code. Um, so how long does it take to write something like this? What would be your estimate? You're saying it depends. How many are capable of writing? 
<laughs> right? How many of you have written names before? Right? So don't bullshit me. It depends. You have some idea of how long it takes to write a name. Right? What? What? Once again. 10 to 20 seconds. Wow. Maybe, yeah, you have longer names here in India, don't you? Maybe that. Yeah. What about a name of about this length? What would be your estimate? Two seconds. Two seconds. Okay. So well, now we're starting to get a range. At least it's not going to take a month, right? Maybe. Right. So I just put this up. Most people say around four seconds. I'll just put that up. Um, what are the factors that, that, you know, it depends. Yes, it does depend on some things. What does it depend on? Style, Style writing. What else? Size, length of name, uh, yeah, my skill in writing. It depends on a bunch of stuff. I just put, put out the most common answers here, right? Quality requirements, does it need to be pretty or can it be fast? Uh, do I have the right tools? What's the font size, etc. It depends on a lot of things, but this is a still a pretty fair estimate. I might turn it into a range, four to eight seconds. Right. So that's how long it takes to write one name. So how long would it take to write five names then? Something around 20, maybe a bit longer because you got to jump between the cards, so, or maybe a bit shorter because you're getting fast, but say, you know, times five, roughly, right? Right. So why did that happen when we actually did this exercise? It took 60 seconds to write a name. And Team B took four seconds. Why? Any, any idea? Do you think Team B had really long names? Of course. Or they, you know, very, or, or they had crappy tools, or or they wrote very pretty names. Uh, you can speculate, right? Yeah, yeah they actually. In, so I shouldn't have written team. I should have written developer because it was just one person writing in in the, in the two teams, right? But a dramatic, crazy difference. This is fifth. What is it? Fifteen? Yeah, fifteen times longer than we thought. Fifteen. It's crazy for something as silly as writing a name on a piece of paper. What can cause that? I'll show you. Um, now, what about how long did it take to write five names then, right? 70 seconds. Huh? How can that be? One name took 60 seconds, five names took 70 seconds. <coughs> Think about that for a moment, right? Team B, one name took four seconds. If I ask a random customer of these five customers, how long did it take for you to get your name? They said four seconds. Here, they said about a minute, right? But if we look at our productivity, how many names did we deliver in a certain amount of time? Turns out that this team over here not only is 15 times slower, they're also three times less productive, right? So these guys can deliver 15 names in the time that they can deliver five. It's, it's crazy. So let me give you a hint, right? For just solving this mystery. So that's the data, right? Here's a chart showing the, the, the timelines of these five different names being written for the first team. What's going on? They're writing one letter at a time. Bingo. Look at that. I started writing Henrik, and then Johan showed up, saying, hey, I need my name written. I'm like, yes, I'll do that. I don't want to lose a customer, right? So I start writing Johan, but I'm not finished with Henrik yet. And while I'm in the middle of Johan, Anders calls and says, hey, you know, I got money here. Can you write my name? Yes, sir. Uh, we'll get right to it, right? <laughs> our, our corporate policy is never say no to a customer, right? So. So we just keep adding up, you know, it's multitasking. And as a result, it actually takes, every time I do this exercise, I get these kind of numbers. It's ridiculous because of multitasking. The other team, what's going on here? Yeah, th they write Henrik, and if Johan calls in the middle of that, they say, we'd love to write your name, but we're gonna finish the last one first. So you have to wait, right? So they have a whip limit. And that's what really matters. The rest is just blah, blah, blah. <laughs> That's what really matters. And nobody brings this up. Try it yourself. Ask people, how long does it take to write a name? And then you ask them, what are the factors that influence this? And they'll give you all these reasons, but nothing about whip limits or multitasking. And that's what really kills us, right? That's what really makes stuff take time when we bounce between projects, right? So th what I'm trying to do is make a business case for the idea of whip limits. Is it, is it working for you? Are you seeing the, the point of limiting whip? Yeah, so they have no whip limit, they have a whip limit of one. It doesn't have to be one, it can be two, right, whatever. Um, another thing, what about planning? After 10 seconds, suppose you're building a system, and these are weeks instead, okay? 10 weeks. From a planning perspective, what do we know here in this first case? Nothing at all. Customers will ask, well, when will my thing will be done? I have no idea. Because maybe five more names will be added, you know, to their project pipeline or, or whatever. So I have no idea. What about here after 10 weeks? What do we know? We've finished two projects. We've delivered them. We're done, right? So we, we know, you know, we know the risk. We know how long stuff takes. 
So yeah, we, we can do proper estimates how long things will take. Oh, your name is slightly longer, so I estimate maybe seven seconds, right? So there's a bit of uncertainty, but it's not this kind of uh, absolutely crazy uncertainty we're talking about. So there's a lot of benefits to doing this, but it's all based on the, the skill of being able to say no. Say no, we don't, we have a whip limit, so you know, we'll get to you. But as a result, we'll deliver 15 times faster than the competitors, right? And we'll charge half the price, because we're much more productive. Right? Just have to wait. All right. Um, so if you have problems with people shoving work on you, causing multitasking, do this exercise. Don't show the pictures. Do the exercise with them. It's really fun. It works. Yeah. Okay, real life example. Um, this is my little sign. It says I should be about th a third way through the time right now. Am I? More or less. Right. All right. This is a value stream map. How many of you have used value stream mapping? Right, a few, right? So this is a game company um, in Scandinavia, and um, they wanted to get faster at building games. So we did a value stream analysis, which means get all the people in the room from different roles. Not the whole company, but different roles. Manager, developer, tester, right? Um, ops people. Just one from every role, and, and map out what are the steps involved to get a game done. You know, a typical game. Turns out that, well, it goes through a, a few people here who have to approve the project. Uh, we've got to present the concept to a concept presentation group. And then uh, we'll have some resource assignment. And then we have graphics being done, sound being done. I'm now tracing this game. Imagine like, you know, DHL, tracing a package, right, going through uh, a city. I don't care how many hours people are working. That's not, that's nothing to do with this. This is just, where, what steps is a game going through? So we yeah, graphics, sound, then we write some code, make, build a logic, and then integrate on the website and get it out in production. Now we have happy customers, right? Hopefully, if it's a good game. And we put times to that. I have to just estimate, roughly, how long time does a game spend in each step. And they can estimate that. Or we can look at examples. We can take the last game they delivered and look at the data, right? But normally, people can estimate it. And why is it one month there, by the way? So Sam approves this concept. And, and why is there a one month wait for the constant presentation meeting, by the way? And yeah, the meeting happens every second month. So the average wait time for the next meeting is one month. They're already there, we have one month of waste, right? This game is just sitting on the shelf uh, for a month, because just because that meeting happens every other month. So the red, the red numbers are waste. Time passed, the game didn't get any nearer done, right? Green means there's work being done. So two hours here, four hours there. What happened here? What does that mean? Yeah, we... we yeah, we approved this game, so we put it in the game backlog. And there's eight other games there. So it took six months for this game to get through that backlog and, and in, 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 into development, right? Wow, six months just sitting there because of a backlog. This is why Mary hates backlogs, by the way, in case you're wondering. <laughs> yeah. Be careful of mentioning the word backlog around Mary, as you discovered yesterday <laughs> during dinner, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and then, uh, um, yeah. Oh, here's pretty effective. We're getting through the system. S graphics, sound is done. We can now look at the game. Say it's Pac-Man, right? I can see Pac-Man. I can hear the sounds, but I can't play the game. Oops. There's another backlog. <laughs> design-ready games. We have 15 design-ready games waiting for coding to start because these guys are very busy working very efficiently. But they, you know. So six months wait there. They work for three months, except that they're multitasking. They're building many games at the same time. So I asked them, what if you only worked on one game at a time? They said, oh, then we can finish it in a, mo in a month. So that means, strictly speaking, they could have done it in a month, but they did it in three months. So from a lean f uh, value stream perspective, that was two months of waste. And then, darn, another backlog, you know, stuff waiting for production, right? So all this took about two years building a game. But it was actually just three months of work, right? So three months of work took two years. This is quite typical. If you do a value stream map in whatever process you have in your company, I would expect something like this, unless you've been optimizing this. It's, it's quite common, and it's quite surprising. So, why does this happen, right? Why does this happen? Well, it has nothing to do with how many hours we work, or how many employees we have. It's not like we've got to hire more people. It's flow control. As long as there is more stuff coming in here, than what is coming out the other end, doesn't matter what we do, right? It gets crowded, right? If you pour in 30 liters of water into a pipe, and you got 20 liters of water coming out, do that every second, the pipe is going to burst, right? And crowded, you get turbulence. So yeah, um, so I'm going to skip this silly metaphor. I don't need it. Um, I think you got my point anyway. So it's a flow control issue. It doesn't matter what we do inside here. We've got to look at the endpoints, right? So how would we tackle this? 
Yeah, you're consultants, many of you. <laughs> Keep less things in flight, yeah, how? Which policy would you introduce to make that happen? Kanban, hey, wow, that's a good idea. Yeah, Kanban or Scrum would work, but it's not the only way, of course, right? What we decided to do was Scrum. Scrum tends to be more revolution. Kanban tends to be more evolution. So you pick what you need. Sometimes you need more evolution, sometimes you need more revolution. And I, I'm not going to explain why. I hope that'll be clear as I do this presentation, right? So we did a revolution. We said, take these people out from here. Put them in the same room, right? Everybody needed to build a game. It turned out to be about eight people in different roles. Put them in a room. You guys can work any way you want, but there better be a demonstrable production-ready game every second week. That was the rule. Do whatever you want, but there has to be a demo every second week. Production-ready game. But, you know, flexible scope. So how do you think the first demo looked like after just two weeks, starting from nothing, if we're building Pac-Man? Yeah, a little yellow ball. That's all, maybe, right? What does that prove? Well, it proves that we can collaborate, we can get something into production, we can draw graphics, we, we can do, it proves a lot of stuff actually. Next two weeks, they demonstrate the guy can move around, right, etc. So every two weeks we look at this thing and we think about what, what to build next. And this is really the, the core of Scrum, right? Now, but the core thing is they're not allowed to build another game until they finish the first game. That's the whip limit, right? So we did this proved that, hey, uh, this team can build a game in three to four months, and they can do it repeatedly, which is eight times faster. It's crazy. People are like, wow. So they just the structure kind of died, and they pulled out more teams. They, after all, we had three such teams. So that became our natural whip limit. Three teams equals three games at a time, instead of like 40, which was up here. So that's an example of how Scrum indirectly uh, reduced our whip, and thereby made us very fast without hiring more people or, or adding more cost. This is this uh, this case um, uh, is is described in more detail um, in in Mary's second book. This was my client, but Mary liked this case, so she put it inside a, a, a leading lean software development. So if you want more details, you can find it in there. It's been on my stuff to blog about list for quite a while. <laughs> All right. So cross-functional teams. Why why does that make you so fast? Well, because if, suppose we have a linear handoff situation here, whether it's requirements, design, code, or whether it's uh, graphics, sound, uh, code, or whether it's code, test, deploy, whatever your serial pipeline is, tends to have people optimize. Joe is really fast, and Dave is really fast. Lisa is very fast. Why is Lisa very fast? Because she doesn't start her work until everything else is done, right? So that makes her fast. Like I don't start testing until everything is done. So then I only have to test once, right? But the whole takes a long time. You put them together in a cross-functional team. Okay, um, the collaboration going on, right? I test stuff before it's done. Whether it's requirements, design, code, or whether it's uh, graphics, sound, uh, code, or whether it's code, test, deploy, whatever your serial pipeline is, tends to have people optimize. Joe is really fast. And Dave is really fast. Lisa is very fast. Why is Lisa very fast? Because she doesn't start her work until everything else is done. Right? So that makes her fast. Like, I don't start testing until everything is done. So then I only have to test once, right? But the whole takes a long time. You put them together in a cross-functional team. Okay, um, the collaboration going on, right? I test stuff before it's done, right? And then there's feedback going up and down all the way. So I'm a bit slower, right? Because I'm collaborating with other people and there's feedback going on. But altogether, we're a lot faster. And we're building a better product too, because we're collaborating, right? So this is one of the reasons why cross-functional teams make you very fast. Um, incidentally, it turns out it's more fun. Almost every company I worked with that moved from this to this say that they enjoy going to work more now. It's, it's more fun. Because we're focusing on building something together, uh, like, a, uh, like a product, instead of me focusing on moving a widget from one place to another. Right? Right, so if we had done Kanban, which we didn't, we did Scrum, but if we had done Kanban here, it would have been like, take the existing process, don't change it, but map it out on a board. Make this value stream map live. And uh, so we could see what's on the board, which game is where in the process. And then gradually add whip limits, and that will drive collaboration and all kinds of good stuff. And over time, we'd probably get similar results. But it would be more gradual, right? So sometimes this is the right solution. When you don't know uh, that, that Scrum is the right solution, you might start with Kanban, right? I, my case study yesterday was, was exactly that. Um, and it's uh, quite common doing this also, you know, work in progress, done, work in progress, done. Um, little tricks you can find, Kanban. Um, so once, anyway, uh, going back to the Scrum case, we have three Scrum teams, that means we can create a, a portfolio level Kanban board. Saying that, well, we have three games in progress here, and this is kind of how far they've, they've come. This one's just being polished. Here it's mostly concept work, 
right? So each game, you know, each game team reports well, where is our, our thing, and then here is the next game. We don't need to have 20 games here. It's enough with one, right? What's the next game we're going to build? That's all we need to know. So we don't need to decide that up front. We'll look at, you know, how, how popular was our last game, and based on that knowledge, we'll choose the next game. Each game takes three or four months, so now we can, we can start experimenting and playing around. What about this crazy game concept? Let's try it out. Before the feedback loop was two years, so it's kind of scary, so we better plan a lot to make sure we build the right game. Here we can just experiment. Um, right, so I'll give you another concrete example. Um, here's a company that, that uh, this is a common trend, you'll probably recognize this. Uh, three teams start doing Scrum, right? And there's a handoff to operations. It's quite common. Some of the best companies I've worked with don't have that anymore. Spotify, for example, they don't have handoffs to operation. Each feature team puts stuff into production on their own, and they're supported by an operations team. It's an important difference. But in this case, you know, okay, there's a handoff. The operations guys get inspired by Scrub. Look at those guys are doing something cool. It seems to make them have more fun and get more effective. Let's do the same. And they do Scrub, and they're like, yeah, but not quite right. <laughs> it got us to a better place, but sprints, mm, nah. It didn't quite fit us, sprints and iterations. So they ditch sprints um, and, and maybe keep the other parts of Scrum and introduce whip limits. And now we have this, Scrum teams delivering to a Kanban team. So in this case, Kanban was pretty much Scrum minus iterations plus whip limits. And then these guys over here get inspired by ops and say, look, those guys aren't doing iterations. And we don't want to do iterations either because we're building all these little things that our, our requirements keep changing. So we don't want to have these fixed sprints. So let's start doing Kanban, us too, right? At Spotify, the teams can choose whichever method they like as long as they, you know, deliver early and often. So some use Scrum, some use Kanban, some combine them. They're quite compatible, right? All right. So um, I'm going to give a little demo of the mindset that Kanban is trying to give a team, right? And this is uh, a, a, a cartoon animation. It's on my blog, too, if you want to. You can just find it um, if you just Google around one day in Kanban land. Um, but... This is a cooler version because here we get stuff moving on the board. Yeah, <laughs> Very simple Kanban board. Um, rather simplistic. Most boards aren't this simple. But just to illustrate the point, here is a backlog. Like, okay, here's a bunch of stuff that we want to get done. You can, you know, are these user stories? Are they bug fixes? I don't know. But this is stuff we want to get done, right? And um, the next two is like, these are not in priority order, but the question is, what are the next two things we're going to build? And it's limited to two. We don't need to, have, we don't need to know what ten things. Because as we start building stuff, we can start thinking about what are the next two, right? S um, and the team starts working on A, and then they finish that. They start working on B. And now this becomes like a trigger to the product owner, if you have a product owner. The trigger is, oh, the team is going to run out of stuff to do soon. I better start thinking about that, right? So another two things pop up there. Um, and we get A done, put it in production. And so basically, you can imagine the, uh, the, the client reaching his arm in and pulling out stuff like this. It's a pull system, right? That makes sense? This is a sunny day in Kanban land when everything is fine and dandy, right? It's called single piece flow. You don't need Kanban if you're this good. Your process is working, right? Kanban comes to use when your process sometimes breaks, which is a more normal case. So let's look at a rainy day in Kanban land. A lot more interesting. Um, just finish this simulation. All right, rainy day in Kanban land. All right, now I added some roles, too. We have a product owner, a cross-functional team of developers and testers, and here we have specialists that, 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 that do release stuff, operations, right? So just an example. Um, and uh, the PEO picks the next two things here. They work as a pair on A, because they think two people is just the right number of people for a f task, right? Whatever. These two people start working on B. Why, by the way? Why don't they all work on A? Wouldn't that be more correct? Yeah, maybe it's just very ineffective. You know, two people is great. Three or four people is a crowd. We don't need that many people. That's context specific, right? So it's a cross. It's a self-organizing team. They choose how to use their time effectively, and they decided that this is the most effective way we can work. Perry, okay, fine. That's why the whip limit's not one. It's three in this case. So we allow for this, right? The team chose this number themselves. Um, product owners thinks about the next thing. And they get done with A, right? So that's a trigger point for the ops guys over here. It puts it to production. It's a handover. We don't like handovers, but sometimes it's a fact of life. So Kanban, you just start with what you have, right? That's what we have. Um, 
all right, um, and they start working on C. You know, they, you know, they finish, right? So they start working on the next thing. It's natural. Oops, something went wrong. Highlight that, right? Something went wrong. That, uh, we got a stack trace. We can't put stuff into production. Darn, right? So maybe they decide to split up. Okay, I'll keep trying to fix this, and Lisa here tries to put B into production. That's their choice, right? How are we going to get flow? Um, what do you think those guys are going to do now? Wh what would they normally do in a typical scenario without Kanban? Yeah, you know, we're done. Let's start working on the next thing. We're programmers, right? They might even they might not even know there's a problem here, and if they do know, it's like that's their problem, right? <laughs> But they can now because look, it's a it's an alarm bell saying look, you know, our work limit is full. We want to add more. You know, it's like it's like paper jam in the printer. Don't keep printing, right? <laughs> Fix the paper jam. So what do they need to do? They gotta go help out, right? Find out. Maybe they can help explain what the stack trace means or something, right? And as a positive side effect, they'll learn a little bit more of the consequence of their crappy code. <laughs> Which is good, learning, right? Follow your, your, your dirt downstream and see what happens with it. Right? <laughs> um, all right, um, now uh, C got done, moved over here. Note that this whip limit applies across both columns, so this got done. And uh, the product owner is not affected yet because his whip limit is not full, right? So he's still thinking about what to do next. But, uh-oh, maybe the whole build environment is down, right? This is, problem is getting worse. So what, what, what are they gonna do now? Go ask, how can I help, you know? Maybe they can't help, maybe there's enough people here. That's fine, the answer might be no, you can't help, you know, or go buy pizza for us, could be anything, right? But go there and ask, how can I help? Um, so this, everybody's, it, this, what this creates, it creates a global sense of urgency and it gradually escalates. Like, we have to fix this and we can't just add more work on top of it. Um, so after a while, even the product owner will be affected. He'll be like, why is my stuff still stuck here, <laughs> right? So he'll be incentivized to wander over and say, oh, what's going on? Oops, blockage here. So what's what should the product owner do? If he's not technical, for example, which, what, what might he do? Yeah, adding more features will create more problems. So, but, so what should I do instead? Should I just go home? There's a lot of stuff I could do, but the first thing I should do is ask these guys, how can I help, right? Because here's the bottleneck. So that's not only their problem, it's everybody's problem. So how can I help? I'm not technical, but, you know, can I help someone? Yeah, you can, you can pick up my kids from school, right? <laughs> you, can, you can block the door so people stop coming in and disrupting us. Or you can get more money for a new build system. Or how about you just go out and buy the new build system? This is what we need, right? So, so this is servant leadership. Um, so this is the kind of behavior that we're trying to trigger. And by doing that, we maximize the likelihood that this problem will get solved quickly before it becomes a big problem, right? And we get learning. Everybody has now learned something from this. Because if it's a recurring problem, we've got to work differently to make it not happen again. Does this make sense? Right? So this is what, what Kanban, the type of behavior that Kanban will, will promote. It doesn't always happen. If people don't want to collaborate, they won't. <laughs> but I've been surprised quite a lot of times. It seems like most people actually do want to do a good job. And they do want to see good results. And when everybody sees the whole, and they see the consequence of their actions, people tend to do the right thing. Um, it, it's interesting. All right, so it stabilizes, and we're, and we're back on track again, right? So evolve your process. I mean, uh, why is the board structure like this? Because that's where we started from, and it's gonna change. So, as common as grown by both empirical, right? There's like meters we can look at, capacity, what's our velocity, how much stuff is getting delivered? per week or something. And what's the average delivery time or flow through time for one thing we're working on? These are easy to measure. I gave you examples yesterday, some of you. Um, quality, defect rate, test coverage, whatever quality metrics you use. And even things like predictability. Now predictability is not a goal. I'm at the panel this morning I said that 100% predictability means 0% innovation. So be careful with predictability. But a little bit of predictability is useful for planning, right? So you can measure that too. And then think of, you know, your process as a bunch of, of, of levers you're pulling on, you know. Should we have a few large teams or many small teams? Should we uh, have high whip limits or low whip limits? Many columns, few columns. There's all these things, you know, no iterations, short iterations, long iterations. Tweak and experiment and find out what happens and gradually improve your process, right? So that's a commonality with both Scrum and Kanban. We don't try to get it right from the beginning. In fact, we just assume it's going to be wrong from the beginning. <laughs> um, uh, Kanban is more configurable, like I mentioned before, because it doesn't tell you that you have to do sprints, for example. Oh, great, more options, right? But, oh, shit, uh, more decisions. <laughs> Good and a bad side, yin-yang, right? 
So here's a, here's a real life example. April 7th, here was the board. Um, a couple of weeks later, that was the board. That was unusually fast. Normally, er evolution is a bit more careful. You gotta be careful too because evolution shouldn't only happen in the direction of adding more stuff to the board. Because then you get complexity, right? You get like technical debt on the board in a sense. So you gotta, you know, maybe we remove a column or simplify it. Right? But just allow this thing to evolve. It tends to stabilize after a while. So how the heck do we know what the right whip limit is? Um, Let me see. Oh, I am on time. Right. So how do I know the right whip, whip limit? Well, I don't. But there are symptoms of being too low or too high. So a symptom of a too low whip limit is uh, people have nothing to do. <laughs> right? We said the limit is only one. And now there are people working on that. So we have nothing to do. If that happens a lot. Maybe the whip limit is too low. Um, and that makes flowing slow. Because we have people who are just doing nothing. Um, Whip limit is too high. How do we know that? Well, because tasks are often idle. Right? We've got too much stuff in our system that's not being worked on. So people are often idle. And here is tasks are often idle. People are never idle here. They're very busy. But it still sucks. <laughs> um, slow flow. Um, and, and you get lack of wall space too after a while. <laughs> yeah. um, so just the right whip limit means uh, tasks are rarely idle. There's almost always someone working on it. People are sometimes idle. That's a price we pay. It's called slack. It's fundamental in queuing theory. Right? If you don't get slack in a traffic system, your traffic system is stopped. Right? So people idle sometimes is fine. That's even good. But if they're always idle, then you're, you're, you're too low. So experiment, right? Find the right way to limit. Start anywhere and then tweak it. So let's do the comparison then. Just a quick comparison. Um, well, Scrum prescribes roles. Kahneman doesn't. So you can choose in Kanban if you want to have a product owner role or not. You can choose in Scrum as well, actually. But if you decide to do Scrum and you decide not to have a product owner, please don't call it Scrum. I mean, it's not important for you to have to call your process Scrum. <laughs> um, it's like, okay, there's not much in Scrum. If you're going to do Scrum, do those things. Or, or, or just decide not to do Scrum. Right? Um, in Kanban, all these are optional. Most teams, I'd say 90% of Kanban teams I work with have these roles. They might not call it the same thing. They might call that, you know, the product manager. Or they might call that, you know, the agile coach. So, but in practice, roughly the same roles. Scrum prescribes these time box iterations where we combine all these things into one cycle. We're planning, we're committing, we're reviewing stuff in a demo, and we're doing retrospective. All this is baked into one cycle. We're doing it over and over again. Nice and simple. But not always suitable. So come on team one, they might do the same. But Kama Team 2 says, ah, we'll use different cycles for these different activities. So retrospectives every fourth week, planning every second week. We skip commit. We skip commit. We just, planning is just, you know, filling up the queue in queue. We don't know how much we're going to get done in two weeks. We'll see. Right? And uh, release every Friday, we just release whatever is done. Right? And if something is half done, we set, a, we set a, a, a feature flag. We say, make this invisible to users. Right? For example. Very common pattern. Yep. Yeah. Uh, the question is, come on time box. Some teams do time box iterations, some don't. So, uh, it, it come on does not prescribe whether you're not going to do time box iterations. What? Uh, so, it, uh, I'll get to that actually. Um, good question. So, in this case, this team here, they don't do a. Okay, they do a retrospective cycle every fourth week. Just a sec. But. Planning is on demand. It's not even, uh, the, it's not a cycle for that. Planning is on demand. You know, when the team is about to run out of stuff to do, they trigger a planning meeting. And, or when the stakeholders want to change priorities, they trigger a planning meeting. Um, so it's on demand. And release is on demand. We release when we have something that is good enough that it's worth releasing. Um, this is very close to just chaos, but <laughs> it's a fine line, right? So you had a question? Yeah. Uh, because So it's a, uh, there's no time pressure in Kanban, but there's release pressure. And the reason why is because in Scrum, there's a, I call it positive release pressure. Um, when the sprint is ended, there better be something to show. That causes a positive release pressure. In Kanban, unless you choose to do sprints, there is no such thing as, th you know, at, by this date, there's something to show. But there's another type of pressure in that we have three things in progress, and we're not allowed to start the fourth one until we finish one of these three. 
So that creates a positive release pressure. We can't put new stuff in until we deliver something. Right? But, I mean, if you like the time box stuff, then do the time box stuff. So, yeah, Kanban doesn't say you don't have to do iterations. Um, although a lot of people go to Kanban because they don't like sprints. That's a common reason. What? What was your question? Break your features. I'll get to that, actually. Yep. So, um, Scrum backlog items must fit in a sprint. That's a difference. Uh, in Scrum, you don't, you don't start anything in a sprint unless you can finish it in the same sprint. That's the rule. So, you chop things down so they can fit inside this bucket of a sprint, right? Which, which is a lot of work sometimes. Often causes good types of behaviors, but sometimes it, you can say it causes waste. We're spending a lot of time making something fit an arbitrary you know, uh, limit here, right? So, um, but that's Scrum. And Kanban is uh, not like that. You can have a long-running task here. A big epic. You're working at the same time as you're doing little things. It doesn't have to be finished right there, right? But there's a whip limit. So instead of saying you can only fit 50, you only only do 15 things because that's our estimated velocity. We say you can do it. You know, you can do as much as you like in a sprint, but you can only do three things at a time, right? So it's a different type of, of whip limit. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. In indirectly, Kanban incentivizes you to break things down because you can't start something new until you finish something old. Scrum is more direct; it kind of forces you. Kanban more incentivizes you. Right? It's different. Um, all right. So both limit whip, but in different ways. In Scrum, whip is limited per unit of time, the iteration. Right? You pick how many things you're going to do, and then that's what you do. You don't pull in new stuff, right? And Kanban is whip limit per workflow state, typically, um, not per unit of time. It's different ways of achieving the same principle. And uh, w which leads to another thing. Scrum batches items into a sprint, right? I mean, we pick like 10 things, um, even though we might only work on one or two at a time. And discourages change in mid-iteration. We try not to add new stuff. This is because Scrum recognizes that people need to focus to get anything done. So stuff keeps changing. We get nothing done, right? But that depends on what kind of work you're doing. Is it difficult, advanced, creative stuff, or is it just little support issues you're doing, right? H how how flow critical is your is this type of work? Breaking tasks into similar sizes is a common pattern, but it's by no means a rule. It's as Scrum teams tend to do that also over time because they see the value in it. Yeah. So, uh, but in, so if, if in the middle of a sprint, the product owner says, I'd like to have E, the typical answer is wait till next sprint, please, because we want to focus, right? Uh, in Kanban, the typical answer is uh, wait till uh, a slot becomes available here, which may be in 10 minutes. Who knows, right? So whenever there's a slot available, the product owner can put something in. Or take something out right now and put it in. So it's a little bit more, in a sense, a little bit more agile, right? We're allowing change more often. But it can be at the cost of less focus and flow for the team. So once again, you know, fork knife. Right? <laughs> it's... Advantages, disadvantages. Another minor difference is a scrum board is reset. You know, you st typically, if you have a board like this, typically it looks like that in the beginning, mid sprint, end sprint, then clear, start over, right? Kanban board is looking like that all the time, kind of. <laughs> advantages, disadvantages. But this is a difference, right? Um, scrum prescribes cross functional teams. Right? Put everybody together, you're a cross functional team. This can be quite difficult to achieve, but it's very valuable if you can do it. Um, so, which basically means that everybody is responsible for everything. Everybody doesn't have to know everything. You know, we can have a little bit of specialization, but everybody shares a high-level responsibility. Um, Kanban team might do the same. In fact, typically they, they often do. But this Kanban team over here might actually have a lot of specialization. And, uh, you know, this guy specialized on that, but works a little bit with this. Same thing here. Right? They're pretty cross-functional, and here's a real specialist. You can combine combine these, this notion of cross-functional and specialization. Uh, uh, exactly. Yes. So the difference here is that if I was going to implement Scrum, I would say put these people in the same room. They plan together. They all commit together to this whole thing. Over here, these guys may be in different buildings. They may have different specializations. They may be in different departments. And they're having trouble. So we start by making a common system that cuts across the whole thing. 
and then gradually this will drive them towards collaborating. And maybe uh, after half a year, they'll they'll start moving closer together, and, and then maybe we're over here. So once again, revolution, evolution. You know, p pick your flavor. Right? Um, Scrum prescribes estimation of velocity, but in practice, I would say don't feel bad about cheating here. Just because it says in a book doesn't mean you really have to do it. But strictly speaking, if you read the Scrum Guide, it'll say you have to estimate. Um, so estimate uh, uh, the items you're building and then use that to, to drive your release planning, right? Which is a pattern you can use. It can be useful. You can do that in Kanban too if you like. It's the exact same mechanism. How many things do we get done per week or per sprint or per day or per whatever? You can measure that. But you don't have to. So Kanban is more open, like, you know, estimate if you want to. So in practice, um, and that's where I get to the tasks, this varies a lot. Some don't estimate features, they just count them. Like I showed you yesterday for some of you, Swedish police. Some estimate in t-shirt size, some estimate in story points, some estimate in days. Right, all this can, this can cause misunderstanding because somebody might believe that three days actually is three days, which it isn't <laughs> in practice. Right, yeah. You can fit a common inside a sprint, yes. I don't see very many do that. Some add whip limits it's on their scrum board. But what I see more commonly is the opposite. You have a bunch of scrum teams that are related to each other, and you have an upstream process like product management, and you have a downstream process like operations, and you kind of put a Kanban across the whole thing with scrums inside. Um, but that's just observations. I can't say it's a rule. Well, typically, yes. There's some kind of, you know, you have commitments, you have contracts, you have promises. The thing is, just, just avoid fixing both date, uh, date and scope, and you're probably fine either way. <laughs> Well, if you try to fix both data and scope, you're probably in trouble either way. Um, but this is a bit off topic, I realize. I should get back, because I have to be done in like, what, five minutes? Darn, time flies, right? <laughs> so I got to wrap this up. Um, so tasks, optional. You want to you do tasks, you want to estimate them, optional. I'd say wh whether you're doing Scrum or Kanban, this is a local decision. Decide what you want to do, right? OK. So I'm going to skip ahead because I want to make sure I don't miss the kind of takeaway points from this talk. There are some minor differences. All this is inside my book, by the way. It's called Kanban and Scrum, Making the Most of Both, which happens to be the same title as my presentation. And the book is actually available free online if you don't want to buy the physical one. You can just Google it and you'll find it, right? So if, you, you know, if you're sad that I'm skipping over some details, don't worry about that, right? Um, I'll skip over some details, blah, 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 blah. And let's get to the takeaway points um, here, final points. Right. This is a summary. If you want to just look at the presentation and get the high-level summary, similarities, differences, this is it. Okay. Oh, by the way, yeah, there's the book. Um, so I'm not going to go through this, but I'm showing you that it's here. Um, yeah, that's the that's the book. Don't be dogmatic. That's a key takeaway point, right? This is dogma. <laughs> um, thou shalt limit whip, or thou art a bad person. Like that. Don't 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 go there, right? Um, uh, or go away. Don't talk to us. We're in a sprint. Use Scrum. Right? Because we're going too much by the book, being too dogmatic, right? Um, all this does, it creates anger and, and resentment, right? People hate you and your, and your process. <laughs> okay, um, and there's some skills you need either way. You can't get away from You have to have these skills, whether you're using Kanban or Scrum or any hybrid. You have to know how to split the system into useful pieces. You have to find ways of doing incremental delivery. If you build one big snowball, you know, the, the whole pile of agile lean principles won't really help you anymore. So it kind of starts there, breaking things down. Craftsmanship. If your code is crap, right, it, these, you know, sticky notes on the wall won't help you, right? <laughs> <It's> <laughs> so, yeah, you got to really make sure there's some, some, some good engineering practices in there, like test automation, etc. And you got to, you know, have the skills and the patience to sit down and talk about process improvement on a regular basis. Because your Kanban system, your Scrum implementation is going to be broken from the beginning. And then you improve it, and you keep improving it, right? So some facilitation skills around that. So take your points. Know your real goal, because Kanban Scrum, it, it isn't the goal. It's just a tool to get you to somewhere, right? Um, never blame the tool. It's, not, it's never the tool's fault. Uh, uh, you choose which tools to use and for what, right? So, um, and don't limit yourself to one. Uh, go ahead, try things from different tools, toolkits. Although keep in mind the thing about learning to ski, right? If you're going to use Scrum and you never used it before, then try following the rulebook first. Learn it properly, then start cheating, right? <laughs> Um, Kanban, you might start the board without whip limits, and you add whip limits later. It's so one step at a time. Uh, compare for understanding and not judgment. Right? It's not about which tool is better. Experiment. Right? Enjoy the ride. Right? We're, we're, we're learning. It's fun. Um, so don't worry about getting it right from the start, because you won't. <laughs> um, 
So the important thing is really not how you work, but your process for how you improve your process. So that's, that's, what, that's what really counts. And that's kind of the core and lean, right? The Kaizen. Right. I think that's about it. I don't want to hog this room. So any questions, stuff, let's do it outside, right? Because there's another presentation here. Thank you. Yeah.